Welcome to My Forever Home, the podcast. I'm Frances Cosway and I've helped hundreds of people create forever homes. I can't wait to share the journey with you. So let's start. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of My Forever Home, the podcast as part of the Sustainable Homes and Living season. Today, which is episode nine of the um, podcast, I had to think about there for a minute. I'm continuing on from the other other episodes about sustainable hard materials uh, that you can choose to have in your home. And today I'm welcoming John Delavira from the Egger Group. Now, you may not have heard of Egger yet, but today's episode will clear that up for sure. I actually discovered Egger a few years ago, who are a manufacturer of wood-based products. So think along the lines of laminate-based products. I was introduced to the product at a launch at Forest One, and they are the Australian distributor for Egger, and I fell in love for many reasons. Egger has outstanding sustainable credentials, They're one of the largest producers of sustainable laminate in the world. They have incredible colours coming out of Europe. That's what happens. And they have really lifelike timber laminates, really beautiful. They're outstanding quality, but I particularly love and use a lot of their timbers and their mineral looking laminates. So today I'm really excited to have John Delavera joining me on the podcast to talk all things Egger. John has a long history in the building industry and specifically in wood-based products, and he's got a strong working background in Green Star projects in Australia and pushing product development. A strong commitment to help source products for design solutions, meeting the needs for a better world, which all sounds exactly what we're talking about on this particular season of the podcast. So thank you, John, and welcome, John, joining me today on the podcast. Thank you, Francis. Thanks for having me. That's great to have you here. So Ega is a world leader in uh, particle board in, in laminate-based products. So for listeners, as I said in the intro, who may not be aware of what Ega's produced, and I just touched on it, can you please outline the products that you manufacture for residential homes? Yeah, um, so um, Ega is uh, probably unique from a world market. So everything we sell, we actually make ourselves. So uh, if everybody thinks of their kitchen uh, or any bit of joinery in their home, so everything from the cupboard doors to laminate bench tops, um, we do uh, a mixture of different products, predominantly based on chipboard. Um, so most of our decor range comes on chipboard. Um, we also manufacture uh, pre-manufactured uh, bench tops with the laminate and board already pressed up. Um, we also do a product um, that's still very unique in the world being Eurolite, which is a thick, lightweight composite material. So it's a uh, simplest way to explain it. It's an eight mil uh, honeycomb uh, core product. Uh, so it has an eight mil particle board either side with a uh, honeycomb recycled cardboard core. And we have it in two different thicknesses. So 38 and 50 mil. So it gives you that thick look uh, you can buy it in a raw option or a pre-decorated, um, but it gives you that thick look for anything from, we've had it used for um, in residential homes, everything from, say, separation vertical beam or horizontal mm-hmm. and vertical beams, uh, sliding doors, uh, normal internal doors and that shelves, is. joinery, bench tops. Um, but the big thing uh, on top of that, do, uh, we also make, uh, or in, we bring in Australia, we bring in uh, only really two MDF products. Uh, one is our uh, Perfect Sense Matte, obviously matte being the flavour of the last few years. Absolutely. Um, in a number of different colours. So we got uh, uh, 12 colours in that product. Um, and also our Green Tech uh, flooring, which is our uh, HDF uh, flooring. It's... Um, I suppose commonly known as a laminate flooring, but it's not laminate as what you would know in the normal DIY residential market. It is a high-end product um, and it's suited to both the commercial and the residential market uh, because there's a lot of different attributes that it has that um, typical laminate flooring doesn't have, um, let alone other other flooring types. So, but yeah, um, but also one of the big things for Egger is that um, we also make our own edging. So we're very unique in that space um, yes. because most other companies source from other third parties. 
So where our edging is very different, especially from a design point of view, is that our edging doesn't, doesn't just match in color, we also match in the surface texture. So if you've got a wood grain with a wood grain texture on the surface, it is also in the same uh, surface of the edging. But in saying that, um, which everybody has this problem when they're picking from manufacturers, when we stick laminate next to melamine board, next to edging, even compact laminate, you tend to have the same color paper, but you'll have varying finishes in the surface texture. And that's the other thing where egg is very unique is we use the same plate finish across all the decors. So it means that you can actually use the same color with the same plate finish in several products in the same installation. So it means you can have that color coordination that you can't get with other companies. The thing that I love about the edging with Egger is not only what you've just mentioned, but also the fact that you have two edging types. You've yeah. got the one that um, looks, well, It's I call it the raw cut because it looks like you can actually see the side of it. It's been, uh, you've probably got the technical name for it. Just and the then you've grain. got what I, sorry? The end grain. The end grain. And that looks so lifelike. So, I mean, it's it's difficult to explain without showing it, but I'm always showing to my clients the difference between the edging, um, that edge, rather than just using a normal one, which is effectively just the same as the face of the board, rather than looking like, the, you know, right. the inside of the timber. And that's probably the benefit in that field wood range is you've got what you call the long grain, which is the typical grain that everybody knows. Yes. Um, so the benefit of that with us is you've got the colour and the surface texture that matches the board, but then having that matching end grain um, means that from a design point of view, you can actually get that solid timber look. Absolutely. All the manufacturing and costs and everything that go with it. So, um, yeah, it's been the, the field wood range is... Um, it's very unique within our uh, wood grain reproductions range. And also some of the other, I mean, we're talking just decorative at the moment, but, um, but uh, you know, I've got a few real favourites that the, the knots in the timber are so lifelike. They've got that depth in them in terms of the depth of field there. They're just fantastic. And that's why we use them a lot. So um, you've got it covered on so many different levels. The one that you probably, I'm hoping you've seen it, but if you haven't, next time anybody's in the forest, one is the, uh, in at Christmas time, uh, we released a new fieldwood, perfect sense fieldwood range. Um, so one of the things that all manufacturers, including us, have is uh, black wood grains always show fingerprints. So now we've yes. got a black wood grain that's anti fingerprint. So um, a lot of designers love it because that's one of the big bugbears of especially dark colours and especially it dark is. grains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So that's a really beautiful synopsis, actually, of all the different um, products that EGA uh, cover. One of the massive things that appealed to me when I heard about and then saw the EGA product at the launch was the sustainable uh, criteria. So how important is sustainability to EGA? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, for those that can see my background here, the, the, the top corner where it says more from wood, um, so the owner or the original starter of the business, uh, Fritz Egger, um, one of the statements he made, and it's still used within our business today, so it's part of our DNA as a business, um, is that wood is too much of a valuable resource to waste. Mm -hmm. So that's not talking about the forest being regrown and then you can harvest properly and regrow. It's about what happens with that product after it's gone through its market. Once yeah. It's of life. Um, so Egg has been on this journey uh, for quite a long time on how do we make use of the resource that's out in the work in out in the marketplace. And there's two forms of that. And um, one of them's being post-industrial waste. So from other manufacturing facilities. So you know their sawdust or their chips or whatever it may be. And you know, some companies do that and do that, do it quite well. The big, the big hick is the post-consumer recycled waste. So if everybody's sitting at home, uh, looks at their kitchen and goes, okay, I'm going to change that now. Currently, uh, and Australia, unfortunately, is very typical of that, unlike Europe, is that that kitchen would end up in landfill. Yep. Uh, where we're very different is we take that back and recycle that back through our business. Um, so we then, you know, we chop it all up, we crunch it all up, we clean the fibres, what we can use, we put back through our chipboard. So um, the extent of our chipboard is that 65% is recycled. 
23% of that is post-consumer waste. The other 42% is post-industrial. So we actually tried to recycle as much as possible in that board. So two things there. My understanding is that you're world leaders in that regard in terms of the amount of post-consumer waste you use in the product that you produce. And that was really impressive to me. I suppose the second question that comes to mind is, so you talk about someone taking their, you know, renovating their kitchen and all those um, cabinetry material would, would end up in a skip and in landfill in Australia. Do Egger take any brand back or it has to be an Egger brand for them to put that back into the manufacturing process? Um, so in Australia, we do nothing and that's probably a... Yeah, but that's typically a Australian. Right thing. Um, but from, uh, so wherever our plants are, so um, two years ago, we opened up our US plant to give you an example. We take, it, as long as it's wood, based we take it back yeah that's doesn't awesome. matter whose it is whether it's come out of a renovation of a house and they've taken all the stud frame out uh if it's timber windows doesn't matter what it is we if it's got timber in it we take it even if hate to say it, if you happen to have an 80 year old chest of drawers that's no longer salvageable um we don't know what the uh timber species is we mm. don't know what the the coatings on it are yeah we back we will do something with it whether it ends up as biomass or actually inside one of our products we will take it back yeah i think that's fabulous so i have to ask is there something on the cards for australia with regards to that sort of recycling um there's actually some work being done by the federal government um but that's an industry whole uh scenario. yes um so that's probably more of a timber industry uh problem because um um, you, you think of Australia and like, you know, the majority of homes are built with stru structural timber or yeah. engineered timber or plywoods. Um, you know, obviously the local manufacturers, um, the biggest problem is, as a side note, is the Asia Pacific still very MDF driven, um, where if you look outside of the Asia Pacific, um, MDF is only used where it needs to be, not as the main source material um, because mm. of that. It's not that you can't use the MDF down the track in other things. It's because you can't put post-consumer product uh, into MDF. Um, so it means that as a circular economy, the product has limitations. Yeah. As far as the circular economy goes. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a hard one, but it's also a change in mindset as well. So uh, this is raising a lot of other questions for me, uh, John. So. You're talking about the Asia Pacific. So for me, the Europeans are the world leaders. And I know we talked a little bit about that offline. So what are they using instead of MDF? Chipboard. Oh, so pure chipboard. Yeah. Okay. And that allows you then to use post-consumer waste instead of, yeah. So that gives you the circular economy. Correct. Yes. So that's what we need to drive in Australia then, or the in the Asia Pacific is to use chipboard to, to get the recycling up to a higher standard. Yeah. And like I said, we use MDF, but we limit um we limit where we only use it where it needs to be yeah okay um the other fantastic look, and the other thing is too the, a big part of what we do also is we, we're always um working with our glue lines so um in australia we're fortunate so all our particle board based products that come to australia are all super zero uh formaldehyde so that's mm -hmm. like 0.3 milligrams or less so you know it from an indoor air quality point of view um the voc you got no VOCs from it. And I mentioned this on one of the previous um, episodes, actually, that it's really important not just to look at the actual component of the product, but it is the the um, the glues and so forth that are being used can actually really be um, bad for your health. So don't just look at one element of, you know, what are the materials going in, but it's also those adhesives and so forth that can really affect you and may not be regulated in other countries yeah and look and and that's the that's probably the big thing you know we get asked about uh products that are on the uh red list uh in the commercial industry um so things like asbestos mercury lead and formaldehyde reduction um and europe's had them outlawed um by their reach government reach um uh, program for quite a number of years um again the problem is you don't know from certain countries if they have those laws or Correct. they sidestep them just to make the product a bit cheaper. That, that's exactly right. 
So I was reading about egg as being egg being part of the United Nations Global Compact. So can you please outline for our listeners what this is and how does it impact what Eggers does as a company? Yeah, so um, we're a participant of the UN Global Compact and then in turn, which we mentioned offline, our sustainability report. Uh, so for anybody who wants to read 165 pages, go right ahead. Um, it might need a wet day like it is in Melbourne, uh, cuddle up on the couch. Yeah. Um, but the UN uh, Global Compact um, is a number of things. Um, there's It's four topics um, and there's 10 principles in there. Um, but in, in essence, in simple terms, it's around modern slavery, anti-corruption, sustainability, um, and you know, being best practice um, throughout, throughout the business. Um, so then that obviously then with the 17 SDGs from the Paris Agreement, you know, we look at things like um, uh, land use, for example. So when we are going into the forest to get trees out, how is the land managed and we let the least amount of impact? So you know, there's, um, you know, like, like I said, with modern slavery is making sure that our supply chain, we have no modern slavery in it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's making sure that as a company, we operate both sustainable, and I'm not talking about sustainable as in the type of timber we use, but sustainable as in, we are a good company, we try to do the best things possible, but also ethical and moral. Um, so we want to try and be one of the, don't get me wrong, listeners, we are not perfect. We do make mistakes, but it's about always having that transparent, continual improvement. Yeah, I mean, that really is just taking it to a whole other level. And it is, you know, you can talk about sustainability from an environmental perspective, but sustainability in terms of exactly the things you're talking about, um, you know, the land and slavery and, and, you know, working conditions and everything else is being sustainable in a modern, in a modern economy. I think that's, it really is taking it the next level. And I know we chatted offline about, you know, people really, you know, gravitating more to sustainability. There is that component, but actually the other thing that I've noticed um, is that people are asking more for products that, are from companies that actually do care about their in, their employees. Yep. So particularly with the issue around uh, silicosis and the use of silica in um, composite bench tops, yep. we've got clients that are now saying, well, I don't want to specify that product because I don't want to be responsible for someone else's health, as in someone getting sick, because I have created a demand for that product. Yep. And that is... I think it's a wonderful thing that people are really caring about those things. But what you're just talking about now is really taking that to the next level. That's exactly what that's about. If you yeah. want to be ethical and yep. have a conscience, then this is this is the thing, the United Nations Global Compact. Yep. And and the big thing is being transparent about it because mm. you know, we talked offline is one thing's getting certified, but you've got to be brave enough to put it out there for people to see. Because like I said, including us, no company's perfect. But if you do the third party audits, it's about how you can always self-improve as a business. Mm. But if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you where you got to go to. So yeah, absolutely. I think more and more in this day and age, people really respect the transparency. People respect um, you know, having the information and they admire people and companies that do that because as you say, no one's perfect. But if you're prepared to put your hand up and say, this is what we're trying to do, I think there's great respect for that. So what specifically is Egger doing to produce sustainable products? So let's get a little bit more into the nitty gritty. So not only in terms of the manufacturing process, which you can walk me through, of course, but regarding things like materials used in the production, which you've touched on in terms of that post-consumer waste, the recycling, um, waste management. Just walk me through how, how this works with Egger as a company. Yeah, so um, Egger... Egger does a lot of different things over the years. Um, so we've got, just to give you an example, we've got an R&D centre at one of our plants, which is the R&D centre for the whole group. Um, and when I say R&D, because everybody, because we're a decorative, everybody thinks it's all about the colours and the finishes. It's not. It's also about the way we use our wood fibre, the way we use our resins. Uh, is there a better way to make something um, uh, to get a better outcome for the products um, in a number of different ways, not just that how the product works, but does it make it more efficient, more sustainable? Can we do other things? So, you know, we touched on the recycling. So 
Um, to give you an example, um, we offline we talked about uh, America. Um, so America now is at the stage with the plant, which opened in late 2019, 2020. They're actually in, uh, they're investing into uh, increasing the post-consumer recycling uh, collection. Um, so uh, EGG is always doing things in that sense. We've done it in the UK. Uh, we've done it through Europe and we're continually doing that. Um, our biomass plants that are at uh, our sites where we burn all, our, all the wood waste we can't use, we burn. Um, and they're doing upgrades to those as well. Um, there are other things where out of our 20 factories, where possible, we run rail lines into those sites. So we reduce the use of transport trucks. So at the moment, 20 of our sites, 11 of them, have rail lines running straight into the factory. Wow. So it means that we can get stuff around the different countries. So from an Australian point of view, which I know we're going to touch on later, the rail goes into port. So on, so then it can go onto the ship where typically a lot of companies will use a uh, truck to go from their site to the port. So mm -hmm. it reduces that uh, CO2 emissions from that point of view. Um, wa uh, water management or, or waste. Um, one of the things um, EGA did uh, a couple of years ago, they put in a bio-organic uh, cleaner. So as I said, mentioned earlier, we still use MDF in certain areas. Um, but um, MDF is also uh, one of those products that when we clean the air, uh, we use typically a lot of water is used. Um, so what they've done is they put a bioorganic. So what it does, it reduces the water usage, but also the chemical usage to a bioorganic. Um, so we reduce 95% of our chemical use, which means that we don't have to clean the water mm. as long and as much. So we don't lose, we, we utilize the water as much as possible and we use the least amount of chemicals as possible. Um, so, you know, there's a few things like that, that, you know, in isolation, they don't sound like a lot, but when you put them all together, mm -hmm. it actually makes a big difference. Um, so what it means is that when we do produce something, um, it means that we try to get the lowest embodied carbon if where possible for the product, um, but we also get the best sustainable result as a manufacturer um, because everybody talks about... Um, you know, you should carbon neutral and buy trees somewhere. Um, but one of Egger's philosophies is let's get better at what we're doing rather than put a Band-Aid over the top and transfer the problem to something else. Mm, okay. And so is there any renewable energy used at the factories and, and, and at the, you know, head office and the offices and so forth? Yeah, so um, that biomass where we burn the fibre, uh, that creates yep. our, our energy. So Egger at the moment, check it out in our last sustainability report. Um, so we're 75% renewable energy. Um, so the last uh, divot of that is fossil fuel based. And you'll see that, you know, we use a bit of gas in product, natural gas in production. Mm -hmm. We've changed a lot of our forklifts over to electric rather than gas. Um, we still need those gas ones because there's no electric equivalent. Um, Cause when you're lifting containers a lot, mm -hmm. electric, uh, forklifts don't have the lifespan. Um, but yeah, so we try to reduce that as much as possible, even things like electric cars. Um, but yeah, so we're 75% renewable energy um, and that's driven by our biomass. Um, now it's about how do we push that to the next 80%, 85%. Yeah. Take those fossil fuels out of our system or reduce them to a point that their reduction is negligible. I suppose solar panels in Austria is not going to be that effective. <laughs> No, like we like we discussed earlier, you know, solar panels. Yeah, I had um, I had Ite from Costantino on, and being in Spain, you know, they can be hundred percent renewable because they can use. I mean, their entire yeah. plant is just covered in solar panels. Oh, but in Austria, we're talking about a different. We're talking about a totally different climate. Yeah, and and that's why biomass works really well because awesome. Whether it's snowing, spring, summer, or autumn, even in summer, like. You know, we're in summer at the moment. We've got clouds in the sky. The biomass is still working. Yeah, yeah. So, how does um what what sets Egger apart from its competitors when we're looking at sustainability? And of course, we're looking at the same space. Yep. So, what are you doing that's ahead of your competitors in terms of the environment and sustainability? Yeah. So, look, there's probably um it's it's a big question um because one we've already touched some of the stuff, but 
the big things for us is that post-consumer recycle content. Yeah, that's... That yeah. circular economy has to be one of the big um, uh, benefits and priorities for the business. Um, you know, it's, um, it's something that not many companies do in general um, in, the timber, in the timber world. Um, because if you look at a lot of other areas, you know, like plastics and that, you'll get a lot of things that are 100% recycled plastic or whatever it may be. Um, so having that post-consumer recycle content and working, and obviously smarter people in EGA than myself, work out what they can do. Um, but yeah, that post-consumer recycle and how we can improve on that is a, a major benefit. Um, the biomass, creating our own power and steam so we become self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. self and how we can use, you know, and, and the world's talking about other things like you know, green hydrogen and things like that. So as EGA evolves over the, you know, the next decade and so, it's about other than biomass, is there other forms of energy that we can create or can use or mm. get access to? Um, but biomass is a big thing. The, the other big thing too is the transparency. Um, so everything we talk about today and in the future is all on our website. So no, like I said, EGG is very transparent even from a global point of view. But our sustainability report um, this year, and we've had it for five years now, so this is our fifth edition. Um, we Normally everybody talks about what they call scope one and two, which includes your products. Um, scope three, which is the company's greenhouse gases. So that's our supply chain, both upstream mm -hmm. and downstream. So um, for those that aren't aware, I travel around Australia, see a few different people. Um, that includes me getting on a plane. So for the when the report came out, the 12 months previous, um, they track that. So our suppliers coming to us and us working. Wow. So they've actually released the scope three um, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, so to give you an idea, it's roughly around 243 kilos of CO2 per cubic meter of wood. Um, and if someone wants to break that down to a, a, an 18 mil product that they would buy or use and design into a kitchen for a door, that's roughly about four, it's a little bit over four kilos of CO2 per square meter. So what it means is we've got a number now, it's about how do we improve that? Mm. And, you know, Egg has made a, a, a statement within our sustainability report, it's now how do we work with our upstream partners to be better? Because and downstream. Because when it comes to us, if they're better, then we're better. And of then course. we're downstream as well. So, um, you know, it's when a company gets to that level, the number's probably never going to be great. But again, it's about if you don't understand it, then you don't know where you need to go. Well, if you don't measure it, you can't, you can't tell anything. So just the fact that you're measuring it, and that is no easy feat. No. Just, I'm just sitting here thinking about all the different people that will be catching a plane within the company all over the world on a daily basis. Uh, that's a massive thing to measure. I can't even begin to think how many people work in the department that measures this stuff. So, uh, you, but also we we get third party auditors to help us out with that. So yeah, yeah, it's... that's just massive. Um, <clears throat> you can just I can just sense and and really feel the care um, that Egger take, and it's still a family owned business, isn't it? Yeah, so the uh, Fritz Egger um, started in 1961. Uh, his sons took over. Uh, yeah. Fritz Egger. They've actually got their third generation in there now as well. Beautiful. Uh, but still a family-owned business. Um, and what's even great is that we also are, we're a brewer as well, not part of our division, but uh, the family has a brewery, which they've had for a very long time. Um, so if anybody's ever coming to Europe and they want a tour, um, we're happy to shout them an Egger beer as well. Gee, are they going to import that Egg of Beer to Australia? Um, it has been into Australia a couple of times as specials um, through Dan Murphy's and Aldi. Gotta uh, say, I better check it out. I, do, I always keep my eye out on it just to see if it pops up so I can have an Egg of Beer. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Not certainly a lot of diversity there. I actually work with a, um, a tile supplier and they make their own gin. Okay. So, you know, that's in Australia. So it's, it's, yeah, well, um, Interesting it's, how you can diversify from wood-based products to beer yeah. and from porcelain tiles to gin. Anything's yeah. possible. What's funny, though, um, one of our plants, uh, Unteraldeberg, which is about three hours away from head office in Austria, that's where the brewery is. It's on the same side as one of our board plants. Um, 
So they share the site, they share the energy and yeah. everything that goes in the brewing. And I think if I recall, sorry, don't quote me on this. I think they showed the financial year just passed in Europe. They went carbon neutral. So, um, you know, they're doing it on their side as well. Yeah, carbon neutral beer, bring it on. <laughs> So I suppose, and you touched on it before, but a question that I think Australian listeners uh, would be asking uh, is around the transportation energy costs and carbon footprint of getting the product from Austria, which is where it's made, to Australia. And I mean, that was one of the things that I was conscious of that, well, you know, we've got some manufacturers in Australia, but I thought the sustainability, I feel that the sustainability criteria in terms of your recyclable um, content in the product is far higher than anything that's produced here. So what are you doing then to offset the fact that it is coming miles and miles across seas to get to Australia, to, yeah. to, to use it in the, to sell it in the Australian market? It's that, that is always an interesting question because everybody that imports, um, the first question everybody asks is, well, it can't be, can't be too good because it's on a boat. Um, so there's a few things there. So um, the International Marine Organization or the IMO, which um, all the major shipping lines are all a part of. Um, so they also signed up to the Paris Agreement. So since the Paris Agreement, they've actually been reducing their uh, CO2 and their sulfur. Um, so shipping's not perfect, don't get me wrong, but it's getting uh, a better footprint. The big thing is though, people assume that when they think about it, they think that there's one container on one boat. So uh, when you uh, look at a vessel, you're actually offsetting your container, which might have, depending on the product, will either have hundreds or thousands of inside it, but it's actually on a boat that's got tens of thousands of containers on it. Mm. So when that boat's coming across, it's actually being offset across the whole boat. When you typically talk about any manufacturer in Australia, they're actually typically shipping it from their manufacturing site to their warehouses using a B double semi trailer of yeah, and they typically have one product on it or maybe two on a truck, and that's it. Shipping into Australia on average is actually more efficient than shipping it, getting a truck going from Melbourne to Sydney. Wow, and we've had uh, I've sat in numerous meetings with architects and designers in the commercial industry, and every importer or manufacturer that imports into Australia has the same. Same discussion question asked. Mm -hmm. So then you add on top of that, because of all the other stuff that we do, our carbon footprint in general is always anywhere from double to nine times, depending on the product, from double to nine times better than the locally produced version. So even if you take that carbon footprint out, we're still better off than the local product. Mm -hmm. So Because of the other things that you're doing that are far superior um that, yeah that's really I hadn't actually thought about the um the trucks the semi-trailers because I mean that is the mode of transport in Australia Correct. yeah so, so so it's and if you look specifically at the timber industry um as a general item most of the mills are all regional they're not mm. you know, they're not in metro anywhere they're all regional because that's where the forest or the wood source is mm -hmm. then they have to bring it into the nearest capital city the other problem is you know, if you've got a factory that's in, I don't know, um, uh, South Australia, for example, um, you know, Mount Gambia, I'll use them because they're a wood producing area or Oberon, you've then got to bring it into Melbourne or bring it into Sydney or bring it into the Queens, uh, Brisbane. So those truck distances get longer. So, you know, and look, the trucking industry is also doing a lot locally to get better, but um, the trucking industry is what is relied on to get product around the country. You mentioned before, though, about the trains going straight in. So talk to me about the trains in Australia. So they're straight out of port into your warehouses here, or how does it work in Australia? So in Australia, typically, um, when it comes to anything that's imported, um, uh, Victoria's a little bit different. They've got trains going into central hubs, but it still comes from a truck, depending on where your, your warehouse is. It will go by truck from the port to that warehouse, whether it's Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, or Perth. Mm -hmm. That's typically what happens. It's um, off the boat, container goes on the back of a truck, the truck goes to wherever the warehouse may be, um, gets on, you know, container comes off, gets unloaded, 
container goes back to port and then back out for distribution or somewhere. Mm. Okay. So yeah, wow, well, that's local, uh, even if you're a local manufacturer, where Ega comes into the port would be no different from it leaving the factory to go to wherever the warehouse. The only difference is the port to the warehouse is probably going to be closer than where the factory is to the yeah, to the regional centre. Yeah, absolutely. So what should listeners be looking for or asking about when they're sourcing a laminate or a melamine product to make a more sustainable choice? Because there is a lot out there on the market. Yeah. And of course, we're talking about the Ega product, but what are some of the questions they could ask their designer or you know, wherever they're getting their kitchen done to make sure they're making a, a really good sustainable choice with their cabinetry materials? Yeah, so the the probably the three main topics, depending on where they're uh, depends on the definition of what someone's asking about sustainable. Um, probably, well, there's probably four, the company. So maybe they can do some research on the company or the manufacturer of the product. Um, third party certifications. That's the big, yeah. is having clear third party certification. So globally, there's a lot of certifying bodies around, um, but they've got to be certified to the standards. So um, uh, if we're talking about sustainability, for example, um, most company, well, pretty much most companies have a third party certification with a yeah. EPD in environmental product declaration, which will also have an LCA. Um, and then there's the recycled content. So like I said earlier, EGA has a recycled content, which is made up of two recycled components. One's post-industrial waste, the other one's post-consumer waste. If you're going to do it, always look for both but obviously with a, a more of a higher slant on the circular economy being the post-consumer, because that means they're taking product that would normally go into landfill. They're actually taking it and reusing it. Mm. Um, and then there's the indoor air quality side of it. So mm. for production, no. So even for example, which we touched on like our flooring, our green tech flooring has no 100% PVC free. So there's no PVC plasticizers in the product. So, you know, look at things for the indoor air quality if they've got, especially we've had more questions around that since COVID hit because of respiratory issues. Yes. Um, so, you know, no VOCs or very low VOCs. Um, you know, people look at it from a paint point of view. There's always been that big, especially over the last decade. Absolutely. These paints or low VOC fabrics. But in the joinery world, that hasn't come, like, formaldehyde's there but no one's actually asked for it specifically um, on the reductions but you know ask about those things as well yeah they're, they're really really great tips and just correct me if I'm wrong I think my understanding is that EGA is a manufacturer with the highest amount of post-consumer and post-industrial waste in their product is that correct yeah, yeah so already a leader yeah so that makes the decision much well, easier when you know that that's there so what are you most proud of in terms of what Ega uh, is doing to become a world leader world leading sustainable company what really makes you really proud um you know what it's I, I go back to the transparency it's not being afraid to say here we are um we're always looking at that continual improvement um, but looking at how we use the wood fibre. Because um, my big thing is sustainable forest is one thing, but it's how you use your resource to the maximum benefit. Mm. Um, and that's the big thing in our, in, I suppose, generally in the timber industry as a global situation is, you know, um, using timber as a bite because it's a bio-organic, you know, we can regrow it. Some timbers take longer than others, um, depending on the species. But we use it but then we throw it in a hole. And that's probably the big thing is that we go and look at how can we use that fibre that's already out in the marketplace and reuse it back through our business, regardless of whether it ends up in our product or for um, biomassing. Um, it's making sure that we use the product to its full benefit and life. Um, mm. Because, you know, we can't just keep throwing stuff in holes. Oh, no, we can't. <laughs> it's, it, it, it seemed like a great idea at the time in the 50s, but it's certainly not well, a great not thing. The options in the 50s, they could only put it in a hole. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, look, so, the, the technology and continual improvement has been a mm, yeah. yeah, that's definitely on our side is the technological advancements in, in what we're able to do. So where can people find out more about Ega products? 
So obviously there's our website, uh, egger.com. Mm. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Forest One, uh, if you go to forest.one, uh, they've got the Egger products on there as well. Um, but egger.com is probably the best starting place. Um, I will say it is a big uh, global website. So please don't, Massive. So <laughs> don't get rid of it. Um, if you get stuck, uh, my contact details are on there. So please flick me an email or give me a call. Um, but um, yeah, there's a lot of information on there. And like I said, because, and that's one of the, benefits of being transparent um, is that there's all this information, but it can also get very daunting when you're looking for stuff. Um, but please have a go. But for those people that are really into the detail, I started reading the um, the environment statement, the environment with sustainability statement documents, 165 pages that you mentioned earlier, uh, John. And I mean, it's a wealth of information, but for those people who like detail, that's awesome bedtime reading for them. But the right. website is incredible in terms of what's on there. We'll put all the links uh, in the show notes. Yep. And I must say that the Forest One showroom, I can only talk for the one in Melbourne, which is in Abbotsford, is just incredible. It's large. It's beautiful. It's also displaying other products that are also environmentally um, sound as well, like bench tops. Yep. But the just to see large scale, um, you know, the decorative boards, particularly the ones that I love, the timbers, and to see them just all over the showroom, you get a really good coffee there as well. It's a really great space to go and yep. touch and feel and see the incredible colours. I just love the colours that you have. And I think people in Australia are getting a little bit braver with the colour that they're using, particularly in kitchens for some reason. We're doing a lot of greens and a lot of um, a lot of blues. But the teal that Egg has got, nothing beats the teal in, in air. I just love it. So that's the great thing about it being a European product. I think that, you know, Europeans are a lot braver with their colours. Yes. Um, and so you're obviously meeting that market from a European perspective and some of those colours are making it to Australia, not all of them, but yeah. some of them. Look, and, and that's probably the benefit with Forest One is that, um, you know, and we'll have a range update later next year, but you're getting the latest European trends now yeah. in two, three years' time. Probably the other thing I should have mentioned as part of it too is with the products is from a designer's point of view, um, our sheet size is actually quite um, from an optimization point of view um, because when you go to the Forest One uh, showroom, you'll see the sheet. It's not the full sheet. It's a big chunk of the sheet, but not the full mm -hmm. sheet. But our sheet's 2,800 by 2,070 in dimensions. Um, so I know a lot, a lot of designers, especially in the kitchen world, um, like doing a lot of the drawer systems. Um, and when you talk to most of the uh, hardware manufacturers, the average drawer now, somewhere between 900 and one meter. Uh, yep. so you chop our sheet in half, you've got your drawers, um, your drawer banks. Um, but also too, because you know most homes now are nine foot, sorry, old school, 2,700 ceilings. Um, our 2,800 sheet goes from floor to ceiling, no joints. So. From a design point of view, it also gives you a lot of flexibility that you haven't had before. That's actually a really good point. Um, there are a lot of, I mean, a standard sheet size is 24 for a lot of manufacturers. And that does affect, and it does from a designer perspective, we have to choose another product because they don't have a 27 or higher sheet board. So uh, sheet size. So that's a great, a great point that it's got that flexibility. And, you know, just on the, the trends coming out of Europe that we're getting them now, you are really generous saying that we're three years behind. I think that we're at least five. Um, and I mean, it's, it's just what happens. We're a long way away, but it takes a while. And I, and I feel that Australians are actually quite conservative, but I'm seeing it change. People are, they're getting more colour and yeah. maybe that's a COVID, something that's happened after COVID that people are going, you know what, I need some colour in my life. The Europeans do it, particularly the Northern Europeans, because I've lived there because the weather's so terrible. It's like, I need some bright colours in my life to brighten my life up. Um, and, you know, we don't need that as much in Australia, but I think it's changing. And I just think that when we're showing people the colours that they can have and being creative about how you can use them, uh, it's great that, that those colours are there. So, um, yeah, it's fantastic. So that picture behind me is our head office, which is in the uh, St. Tyrol in Austria in the Alps. Um, so if anybody's ever around, uh, yes. Looking pretty flash. It does look like that. And um, the offices do have very nice views of the Alps. So Beautiful place to work. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, John. That's been an amazing, um, amazing set of information. And I know the listeners are going to get so much out of this episode. And particularly, they're going to know of a new brand. Um, I know every client that I've spoken to, and we introduce Egger to them, it's not familiar. So I hope that a lot of the listeners can now go to the showrooms and have a look, touch and feel it, see how different it is to what's available, but also knowing that you are then selecting something that has got really good sustainable criteria and um, and that UN um, global global compact um, criteria as well is, is being met by the company too. So it's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing and joining me. No problem. If they come, I'll get them a beer. There's, there's the egg a beer to check out. Well, Aldi and Dan Murphy's. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of My Forever Home. If you're ready to renovate or build a new home and you need help to create a beautiful and functional forever home, you can book a chat with me directly at whitepebbleinteriors.com.au backslash chat. Have a great day.